We're gonna talk about the Civil War chapter here today. And um, let me kinda zoom in on the lake. It's a dreary day, I'm outside. It's cold, it's chilly. There's still some swans here. I had 34 swans on the lake the other day. You can still see some out there um, doing their thing. I don't know how many are in the lake today, but a lot less than the 34. There's some ducks and geese and things like that in various spots. And um, All right, but uh, hope everyone's doing well with the new lockdown and stuff and hope you guys are staying positive but uh, let's get to chapter 15 here and um, so here we go guys um, chapter 15 there's this belief that democracy is failing in the world some of the European powers that had turned towards democracy have already kind of failed and reverted backwards into some sort of a dictatorship or or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, even look, kind of look at like Napoleon and how that, that kind of fell apart with the French Revolution, and and um, so this is kind of belief that democracy is failing in the world. And one of the prime examples that these European elites give is they look at America and our dysfunction between the North and the South, and they kind of use that as an example of um, this this fail this failure of democracy in the world and there there are some educated elites who are literally talking about how educated er, democracy is this failed experiment it's it's going nowhere um, and any it couldn't be further from the truth that uh, you're about to have this new birth of democracy in many places um, and the civil war will happen showing that you know some of the dysfunction in America but on the other end of the civil war as bad as it is. On the other end, we're going to come out a stronger country. Um, but, uh, all right, guys. So, another thing here is uh, King Cotton. So, King Cotton. Um, a lot of uh, Southerners believe they have this, like, special advantage because of King Cotton. Remember, cotton, you don't have, like, these, these space-age fabrics yet, like polyester and things like that. It's basically silk, rare, expensive, wool, itchy and scratchy, but, but easy to get your hands on. And then cotton, which you can make it nice and smooth. And so everyone wants to wear cotton because it's it's now affordable from the cotton gin created at the, the turn of the 1700s to the 1800s. And um, But the South, the American South supplies three-fourths of the world's cotton supply. And because cotton is such a big deal, that gives them a huge world uh, influence. Um, Britain has massive textile mills. The Northeast, places like Massachusetts, have massive textile mills. And um, in the South, believes because they have King Cotton, this this the most important, arguably the most important um, export, certainly the most important export of the United States at the time. There's this belief that if the if the the South got into a fight with the North, Europe. France, Britain, would come running to the aid of the South because they don't want their cotton supply disrupted. However, this isn't going to be the case. And it's not going to be the case because Britain had already started making preparations for this. Uh, they, had, they had warehouses full of cotton. They bought a bunch of cotton and backup uh, extra supplies. But they also had started trying to plant cotton in other places like Egypt and cotton in India which they did find some success with. So <clears throat> Britain was able to, get, you know, it, it never really hurt them too bad. You get these people called cooperationists. These are Southerners who want to break off, but they want to break off in un unison. That, like, let's get all slave states on the same page, then break off and form our own independent slave country. Um, independent from the North. Um, whereas on the other hand, there's these people called secessionists. And... Uh, the secessionists are um, the, these people who are kind of like firebrands. We should break off. We're unwavering in our support for the breaking off. And what we should break off any way we can, piecemeal. You know, one state at a time if necessary. Um, so the secessionists are a little bit more uh, firebrands than the cooperationists. You guys can see I took my part of my dock out. You can see it's right there. Uh, a little 8 by 8 and I can have it as a floating raft and sometimes the kids and I will take it out in the lake together but um all right now guys enter the election of Lincoln 
Um, Lincoln never says, this is the biggest misconception is number one here. Lincoln never says he's going to free all the slaves when he runs in 1860. In fact, he says he can't. He says illegally the president can't. He does say slavery is immoral. He says if slavery isn't wrong, then nothing is wrong. He says, um, you know, a, a, the country can't survive, can't long endure, half slave and half free. But he never says, I will free all the slaves. He says, legally, the president can't. It's protected by the Constitution. What he does say, what greatly upsets the South, is that he will stop the expansion of slavery westward. He says he's going to stop the expansion of slavery westward. And the North already has far more people. There are more people moving from the South to the north and vice versa. There are more, far more immigrants moving to the north. So the north is already controlling the House of Representatives. They're already controlling the Electoral College. In fact, Lincoln wins the 1860 election. He doesn't, he's not even on most southern states' ballots. And the ones he, he happens to be on, he doesn't do very well in. Not, not surprisingly. But the fact of the matter is, the north has won the population game, so they're dominating the Electoral College. He doesn't need a single southern state to win doesn't need a single slave state to win. And so the fact that he's saying we're going to stop the expansion of slavery means the North will now also do dominate the U.S. Senate because no new slave states is what Lincoln is saying. No new slave territories, no new slave states. Plus the fact that Lincoln is saying things like if slavery isn't wrong, then nothing is. It's greatly upsetting the South. And although Lincoln never says he's going to free all the slaves, part of the misconception comes from the South at the time, including their major newspapers and so forth, are saying he said that, that he's going to free all the slaves, but he never does. The South is accusing Lincoln of lots of things that he never says he would do, including forcing racial amalgamation, which is like that some Southerners are literally saying that Lincoln was going to force you to marry people of the opposite race to force equality. Lincoln never says anything even remotely close to that. But the South is kind of losing their mind over a possible Lincoln presidency. And to be quite honest, there's a lot of people just making up things hysterically that uh, Lincoln never actually says. But um, you get this famous Crittenden Compromise, this proposed amendment, which is rejected by Lincoln. A potential compromise that would guarantee the protection of slavery forever in exchange to preserve the Union. It's not really well supported in the South, but Lincoln says no to the Crittenden Compromise. Um, you know, th th this, this concept that, you know, look, we'll, we'll guarantee slavery exists where it exists forever. And, uh, and then there's no need to break off. Lincoln uh, balks at that. The Confederate states break off. Uh, South Carolina is the first. The seven states in the Deep South break off. After Fort Sumter, four more Confederate or four more Southern states will break off. So there's going to be 11 Confederate states. Not all slave states break off. Um, the slave states that don't break off are, uh, let's just start in the east and move west, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. West Virginia doesn't exist until the Civil War. Western Virginia doesn't want to break off the country. Virginia votes to break off the country after Fort Sumter. And so to make a long story short, West Virginia breaks off of Virginia so West Virginia can remain in the Union. And technically, they, they keep the institution of slavery. So that would be five slave states now that do not break off the country. Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia... Kentucky and Missouri. Um, now, uh, so could the Confederate states break off? Jefferson Davis becomes their president. He had been like a former senator. He had been like a former um, secretary of um, war. Um, so basically, guys here, um, Jefferson Davis is kind of known for like uh, micromanaging a lot of people and like, hey, you're my friend. I'll give you a position even if we're not qualified, oh, you're not my friend, I'm going to give you a harder time. And and so a lot of people think Jefferson Davis could have done a better job leading the Confederacy. He does not. Whereas Lincoln doesn't even care if people insult him as long as they're doing a good job. Hey, I want the best person doing the, the job. I don't care if you insult me. Whereas Jefferson Davis, you know, my friends are, are doing the jobs. And if you're not my friend, I'm going to make sure you get fired or have a really bad time or get demoted or whatever. Uh, Fort Sumter. It's the spark that sets off the Civil War. Now, the tensions have been building up. The, the causes of the Civil War are things like the North and South feuding over the expansion of slavery. The North and South feuding over things like the, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act. 
But the spark that sets off all these tensions is Fort Sumter. It's a man-made island in Charleston, uh, which is South Carolina's biggest harbor. Um, the second biggest harbor in the Confederacy. New Orleans being the, the, the biggest with the whole uh, Mississippi River. But the fact of the matter is, guys, is that uh, basically the South says, hey, we want to purchase this island fort back. It's a man-made island that South Carolina had basically, pre before the Civil War, given all rights to the national government. And the national government refuses to sell it. Um, but the problem is, is that there are Union soldiers in the fort. And the fort's not even com completed yet. They actually left Fort Moultrie. That's a different story. To Fort Sumter. Because it was, uh, Fort Moultrie was uh, kind of like in a dangerous spot. And Fort Sumter is a slightly less dangerous spot being out in the middle of the harbor. But Lincoln notifies the Confederacy that, hey, he's going to peacefully resupply the fort with food, medical supplies, things like that. But no, no weapons or ammo. And uh, the South chooses to fire on the fort before Lincoln can resupply it, uh, which is the first shots of the war. The South fires the first shots of the war. Lincoln didn't want to fire the first shots of the war because of the fact of the matter is um, a lot of Northerners kind of thought, well, if the South wants to break off, let them. Good riddance to those, to those people. And the fact of the matter is... Uh, if Lincoln fired the first shots, the North might have not been in favor of fighting the war. But when the South fires the first shots, the fact of the matter is, geez, the North just gets their, what the South would say, their dander up. We want to fight. How dare they fire the first shots? Um, you know, um, and so uh, you, you, you kind of consider this, guys, and... Um, and, and you, have to, you have to think about it. It, it. The South really probably made a mistake by firing the first shots. Because the North just goes from kind of like, yeah, we shouldn't go to war, to bam, in favor of war. And they actually parade the flag from Fort Sumter, which had holes from it, uh, from, from the shelling. that the, When the Confederates shelled the fort, they parade the flag around the North. And people just are just in the North are just so incensed by this. What are the advantages? Uh, the North... They have the industry. They have, they have close to 90% of the industry. They have they have a stronger navy. They have far more railroads and connected railroads. They have more money. They have more population. And we always think of the South as agricultural, but the North was just as strong agriculturally, except they grew things like wheat, whereas the South was growing things like cotton and tobacco. And yeah, food too, but, but the North was growing like food. And the South, much of it wasn't food. It's still cotton's valuable, but, but but by the end of the Civil War, the South is the Southern Army is literally starving. But this is a huge that the South they know the terrain. They're fighting on their home territory. They're close to the resupply lines. The North farther from the resupply lines. The South can fight in the defensive. The North has to invade the South. The South breaks off. If the North says, no, you can't do this. If the North says, no, democracy means sometimes you lose elections and you can't just break off willy-nilly. The South, if they break off, they're down there by themselves. The North has to go down South, force them back into the Union, kicking and screaming. So the fact of the matter is the South can fight in the defensive. You have to come to our home turf. We can get behind forts. We can dig trenches. We can do this. We can do that. And the defensive fighting back then was a huge advantage. The Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Lincoln issues this August... Um, I'm sorry, September 22nd, 1862. Um, and the Emancipation Proclamation... It, the most forgotten thing it does is it allows black soldiers to join the army, whereas they had been pro prohibited before. And then the, the second thing it does is something that people always remember, is it frees all slaves in rebel areas. Notice it made rebel bold-faced. It was very controversial and attacked from all sides. One, A lot of abolitionists attacked it, saying, look, uh, so, so what are you saying? So what are you saying? Are, are you saying that... Um, are you saying that we can uh, uh, own slaves in, like, Maryland, okay? Yeah, technically it doesn't free any slaves in Maryland because in Maryland didn't break off the Union. It's not a rebel area. It only frees slaves in rebel areas. And, and it, uh, although it was announced on September 22nd, it didn't take effect until January 1st, 1863. Lincoln was actually hoping that would maybe bring some of the South to their senses and maybe they would come back in. Didn't happen. 
But uh, a, a lot of, uh, like Frederick Douglass says, so, so, so what's the message here? Is the message that it's okay to own slaves so long as you're loyal to the Union? But, but a lot of other people attacked it. You're just going to enrage the South more. Um, you know, uh, how dare you allow blacks to fight in the Union Army and give them guns? And that's going to upset the South more. How dare you? Um, this war is about preserving the Union. How you shouldn't make it about slavery now. The North initially fought to preserve the Union. Slavery becomes a goal of the war only halfway through the war. Ending slavery becomes a goal for the North, but only halfway through the war. Um, and so this is issued after the, the Battle of Antietam, which is kind of a draw, but uh, Lincoln had actually written it months prior and wanted to issue it, but his cabinet said, wait, 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 it looks like we're losing the war. It looked like a last act of desperation. Lincoln declares Antietam a victory and then issues it publicly. And But a lot of people are excited about it. A lot of uh, slaves and stuff are excited about it and, and so forth. Um, but but here, here's another catch. Technically... The Emancipation Proclamation frees slaves in rebel areas, but you still need the Union Army to go down there with an army and free slave by slave, plantation by plantation, for the, the Emancipation Proclamation to go into effect. Because it, you can't actually, like, like, think about this for a second. The Declaration of Independence, did it instantly free Americans, or did America have to fight the Revolutionary War and win the Revolutionary War before we were actually independent from Britain? You see my point? Um... Gettysburg and Vicksburg are these twin victories. Gettysburg, the, the South invades the North, repulses them at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, the North captures Vicksburg, the last holdout on the Mississippi River. Now the North can send boats all the way up and down the Mississippi River, pretty much unvexed. Um, New York City draft riots, and this shows you just kind of like how bad the kind of times are. Um, <coughs> um, Irish immigrants are opposed to the war. They don't like the draft. And, and a lot of Irish immigrants, especially after the Irish immigrants did not like the Emancipation Proclamation, you're going to free all those slaves and then they're going to move north and they're going to take my job here, my factory jobs in New York City. And so uh, the New York City draft writes, the Irish attack, um, they, they, they attack uh, various playing things. They attack free blacks in New York City. They attack draft uh, locations. They, they actually attack a black orphanage. They hang a black man chanting hurrah for Jeff Davis. Sunburnt troops from Gettysburg, not not like the whole army, but some uh, some sunburnt troops from the Battle of Gettysburg had to be detached from the Army of the Potomac, sent to New York City to put down the, the draft riots, which were predominantly Irish immigrants. Um, so you can see like the, 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 the tensions and the problems. Um, and uh, the anaconda policy versus aggressive defense. The North is trying to like strangle the South. We have a naval blockade, so they can't sell cotton, and they can't. And they don't have factories, so it'll be harder for they, they. They can make some guns, but they can't make enough guns. So we're going to cut out their 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 supply of guns, and and then we're going to capture their capital, and we're going to, you know, uh, kind of like strangle them. Versus the aggressive defense. The South in the defensive, but they'll look to go on the offense whenever they can out of the defense. Greenbacks uh, to help fund the war, to create paper money not backed by gold, not backed by silver, um, to help fund the war. Very controversial at the time, but to help pay for the war. Um, McClellan, uh, he's this former general of Lincoln's, and they constantly butting heads. He insults Lincoln all the time. He gets fired, rehired, fired. Uh, he's very timid on the battlefield, which is why Lincoln fired him. Uh, he was great at training men, but he was just too timid on the battlefield. But he actually runs against Lincoln in 1864 as a Democrat opponent to Lincoln, the Republican. And the fact of the matter is McClellan loses. But it was a very interesting election having McClellan being you know, the former general. The Civil War kind of comes down between Grant and Lee. They neither start out as the top general for their sides. But by the end of the war, Grant's a top general for the North. Lee's a top general for the South. Lee's considered this great, audacious, attacking general of the South. Grant's kind of like this persistent underdog who's just always aggressive. And um, Grant kind of wears down Lee. Grant maneuvers a lot. Eventually, Grant, with his superior numbers and maneuvering, get Lee cornered and Lee surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. The Sanitary Commission, the federal government works with private agencies to help kind of... Um, 
take care of all the sick and wounded. And, and remember, uh, more people die in the Civil War from disease than actual enemy bullets and things like that. And, and like part of the Sanitary Commission, it's not just helping the sick and wounded soldiers, it's also the camps. Like a lot of these soldiers' camps would, would do things like not have the latrines where the, the men are, you know, excrementing uh, their waste, uh, not far enough from water supply sources. You don't want to drink water that can be contaminated and get cholera and crap like that. Um, but uh, guys, Clara Barton, she gets nicknamed the Angel of the Battlefield, Clara Barton. Um, She's this great woman. She's like she's like for women's uh, voting rights. She's she's uh, she does so many great things, but uh, the newspapers at first like, call her a prostitute. The, the battlefield's no place for a woman, but the Union soldiers love her, Clara Barton. In fact, the number one name of a daughter of a Union soldier during the Civil era of Civil War veterans was Clara, and. And she would go out in the battlefields and tend to soldiers while the fighting was still going on. In fact, at the Battle of Antietam, a bullet passed through her dress and hit, missed her, but hit and killed the man she was attending to. And the soldiers loved her and called her the angel of the battlefield and should bring them water and food and medical supplies. And she became this great kind of like national hero. She creates the American Red Cross. Now, the Red Cross already existed in Switzerland. But uh, she creates the American Red Cross. She does so much great charity work throughout her whole life. She's an a American hero, and the soldiers loved her dearly, despite what the horrible newspapers said about her at the time. But hey, kids, I um, hope you kids stay positive. I hope everything's going great for you. And um, stay positive. Have, a, you know, have, a, have some good times with your family during this remote shutdown. I'm freezing. I'm going to get going back inside. But hey, let me send me emails. Show up to office hours. Show up to the mandatory Google Meets. But have a good day, guys. Send me emails if you ever need help. If you just want to say hi, take care, guys.